Hey everybody, it's John with Renovate Your Mind. Today I'm going to be showing you how I turned my dining room wall into a built-in electric fireplace with a hidden compartment. This project started out with a trip to my local Menards to get 2x4s for framing that would act as the backbone of this build. I first had to remove the baseboard since it would get in the way of the framing. I used a utility knife to cut through the caulking to help prevent the drywall paper from ripping. I want the framing to be centered between the two octagonal windows but the studs in the wall are not centered, so I put up some horizontal 2x4s. This would give me something strong to attach the framing to without having to be cognizant of where the stud locations are. I felt like three 2x4s would be enough, but I ended up moving the middle one down a few times until I felt like it was at the right height to act as the back support for the hidden compartment. I know that sounds confusing now, but that'll make more sense later on. Now since my laminate floor is a floating floor, I can't anchor the framing down through it because that would no longer allow for expansion or contraction of the floor. So after cutting some of the 2x4s for the framing, I set them in place and marked the edges with painter's tape. I then used the circular saw to cut through most of the flooring and the oscillating saw to cut through the corners. After a quick cleanup, I cut and assembled the two boxes that would act as the side walls. I then stood each of them up and screwed them into those horizontal 2x4s in the back. The box for the front wall was assembled in similar fashion, but also needed to include the openings for both the fireplace and the hidden compartment. Even though I don't show it here, all of the pieces were set in place with screws before I stood the whole front face up and then secured it to the side walls with more screws. After I stood it up, I realized that the side wall and the front wall didn't quite match up to each other. As we know, 2x4s are never straight, so I used some clamps to bend the two together and then secured them down with screws. I also secured all the framing to the floor. So at this point I dragged the fireplace box into the room and started taking it out just to see what I was working with. And I realized that you actually secure the box to the back side, like where the wall would be, rather than to the sides of the frame. So I had to install some extra 2x4s to make up for this. So the next step was to cut out some backer board that would be used on either sides of the framing to cover up the wall. And my original thought behind this was that it might make the whole thing look more like a solid built-in piece, but in the end I don't think it really had this effect and you can probably skip this altogether. Of course, after cutting these pieces out, I wanted to test fit them to make sure I didn't screw anything up. But when I tried to fit them in place, I realized there were a couple of obstacles in the way. One being the baseboard, and the other being the window trim. I was planning on putting some bookshelves in this space here, so I measured out the distance that the depth of the bookshelves would be, and then I used the oscillating tool to cut out and remove the baseboard. And I did this on both sides. The window trim was also in the way though, and I used a pry bar 
to pry it away and pull it off the wall. The left window here was pretty straightforward and came out really easily, but the right window actually came out just in one piece. So I had to break it down and remove all the pieces and then put it all back together with a brad nailer. And seeing how easy everything seemed to come out, I used the brad nailer to hold everything in place as well. With both of the backer boards cut, it was just going to be much easier to paint them down in the basement and before they go up on the wall. This color is called refined gray, and the lighter gray color that I use throughout my house is called zippered gray. I seem to get a lot of comments asking for what the colors are, so there you go. To hold each of the backer boards in place, I squeezed out some construction adhesive all over the drywall and then pressed each board up against it. I ended up tacking the boards into place with a brad nailer and I only nailed along the edges because I knew those nails would be covered up later on in the project. Now obviously I'm covering up the windows here which is kind of a problem. You might have noticed from earlier footage that my kitchen is directly opposite this room, kind of behind where the camera is sitting now. I was planning on using my router to cut out the octagons, which will create a lot of dust. So I hung up a sheet of plastic just to try and contain some of the mess. So I used a hole saw with my drill to punch a hole where the window is. And thankfully, my estimate on where the window is was accurate because that would be pretty upsetting if I hit the edge and ruined the whole piece. I then used a flush trim bit to trace along the edges of the window and cut out the backer board. And as you can see, there is no shortage of dust. The plan of attack was the same for the other window, only this time I remembered to actually wear my dust mask. And it wasn't until I started cleaning up the window that I looked in the camera and realized just how dusty things were. I removed the two Death Star models and then it was time to get started on the nickel gap boards. I carried all the boards down to the basement just to show them how good they have it being up on the main level. But while I was down there, I figured it was a good time to paint them all white. The first layer is easily the most important layer because they all stack on top of each other. So if your first layer isn't level, none of your other layers will be level either. And of course the floor in my house is not level, so it wasn't as simple as just laying the board on the floor. To account for this, I shimmed the right side of the board to make it level, and then used a compass to scribe the contour of the floor on the board. I took the board down to the bandsaw and cut along this line. The one you're seeing me cut here is one of the sides, which is why it's so short. But the concept is the same for all the boards. Then back upstairs, I can set each of the boards directly on the floor. And not only do they contour to the shape of the floor, but they're also level. All of the boards were installed the same way, with some construction adhesive being applied to the framing, then pressing the board in place, and using the brad nailer to secure it down. It's important to nail through the tongue of each board though, and not on the exposed face. That way when you put the next board on top, it will cover up all the nail holes, and you won't have anything to patch. <laughs> 
The opening looks pretty clean here, but there's actually a slight overhang on the top and bottom edges. So I used the router with that flush trim bit again and cut away the MDF so it's flush with the framing. But with the opening done, I couldn't help but do a test fit just to make sure the fireplace would fit. All the layers from here on out went pretty much as expected. The only exception was the top layer. It had to be cut down on the table saw because there wasn't enough space for a full board, which means the tongue on top was no longer present, and so it did not get any nails and was only held with glue. So I have this Japanese pole saw, and here's where the dumb came out. In my infinite wisdom, I figured that I could use this saw to cut away the overhang on the opening and therefore not have to use the router and create a bunch of dust. So after making several small cuts, I eventually got to where I could saw horizontally and cut away all the overhang. Unfortunately, I cut a little bit too deep in some areas, making for a pretty poor looking cut. The good news is that later on I was able to actually fill this and make it almost disappear. I removed the fireplace in preparation for more dusty router time and then set up another sheet of plastic just to shield the kitchen from all the dust. I cut and installed a sheet of hardy backer board on the opening here and nailed it in place. This created a small crevice underneath that I could fill later on to cover up those rough cuts. But now it was time to start constructing the bookshelves that would go on either side of this build. I took a sheet of foam insulation outside to use for cutting on and then carried the plywood out. The star of this part of the show is this Craig jig that allows me to make repeatable cuts on the plywood over and over and over. This made it really easy to cut out all the shelves for both bookshelves. All of the shelves got carried down to the basement and then cut down to size on the miter saw. All of the shelves got painted white, and any of the shelves that would be visible on the underside as well got painted on both sides. My workbench here came in really handy for assembling the bookshelves. Everything was initially held in place with glue and brad nails, and then afterwards I added some screws for extra strength. And since the bookshelves are being placed between the wall and the fireplace, you won't see any of the screws. Now the top shelf is going to be sitting on the side supports instead of between them like the other shelves. So I added some pocket hole screws to hold the top shelf down. I made the face frame out of some maple that I cut down and glued and pocket holed together. I clamped it onto the front of the bookshelf and then tacked it in place with the nail gun. This means I will have some nail holes to fill later, but they shouldn't show in the end. The main thing holding the face frame on are the pocket hole screws on the side supports. Skipping ahead here, both bookshelves are now done, but require a bunch of cleanup. I used a flush trim bit in the router again to even up the edges along the face frame and then I did a whole bunch of sanding to make everything smooth. <laughs> 
After sanding, some paint was needed to get everything looking nice and clean again. I think the bookshelves came out looking fantastic. They're probably my favorite part of this build. At this point, they just needed the backs added onto them, and that was fairly easy to do with some glue and brad nails. The real question though at this point is whether they're going to fit. And the answer is just barely. The tolerances on the right side here were so tight that even the wall plate was preventing me from sliding it in. It wasn't until I lifted it above the wall plate that there was enough clearance for it to go back against the wall and slide down. To class things up a little bit, I added some crown molding. This not only had the benefit of looking better, but it also covered up some of the nail holes that were previously showing. So I originally bought this piece of MDF to use as a piece of trim that would cover up this rough edge here where the side of the MDF shiplap, shiplap is exposed. But unfortunately it isn't quite long enough to cover the gap. So I made just a small offcut as a test piece and it turns out that it will fit pretty nicely over the lip of the window and I can use that to trim out the window. This miter gauge comes in handy in situations like these and tells me exactly what angle I'm working with. So in a single cut that angle could be made up with a 45 degree cut but it also shows the miter cut which is 22 and a half degrees. All of the pieces were cut down on the miter saw and then assembled with CA glue and an accelerant for faster drying time. I think this new trim looks much better than the old, but I still had to go back and fill gaps and nail holes with caulk. And then after that, everything got a final finishing layer of paint. I nailed in some more trim in the corners to cover up nail holes, and I used a better sized piece of trim to cover up the rough edge on the nickel gap boards. Things were shaping up pretty well at this point, but it was time to tackle building the hidden compartment. I took some measurements of the opening, and then cut down some plywood to make a box that would fit it. But since the rough edge of the plywood would be showing when the doors open, I added some edge banding to clean up the plywood edges and just make them look a bit nicer. Once all the panels were painted, I assembled them in usual fashion with glue and brad nails. I then went to attach the door, and if you look closely, you might notice a problem. So once I made a new door, I attached it with some hinges that would open up kind of like a hatch. The problem is that the door wouldn't stay open on its own. From here I started some experimentation on how to make the door opening work properly, even adding some gas struts to hold the door open. But the problem now is the door was held open all the time and wouldn't stay closed. So I took the next logical step and got some struts that were weaker but they were still too strong. So I ended up letting go of the idea of having a fancy opening and instead went with some traditional cabinet hinges 
I wanted to add a recessed power strip so that I can use the hidden compartment to charge a laptop, a tablet, or any other device that I want to keep in there. I used a Forzner bit to drill a hole where the opening would be. I made sure to attach a piece of wooden backing on the underside to protect from blowout. I then cut the rest of the shape out with the jigsaw. Adding the backing on this box gave it just a little bit of extra rigidity and also helped with the door sagging. I had to fight with it just to get the compartment into the opening, but once it was in I secured it down with some nails and some screws and then patched and filled everything. And now that the hidden compartment was in its final resting place, I could route the cable through the cutout and install the power strip. The power strip plugs into an outlet that's located in the opening for the fireplace here, and once it was plugged in, I could then reinstall the fireplace for the final time. I may have had to give up my fancy hatch style opening, but I was determined to use this electronic latch to keep the door shut. It's designed to be opened with a key card or a key fob that can be detected through the door. And after a few seconds, it automatically relocks. Using the provided template, one piece gets mounted in the box and the other to the door. I have it plugged into the power strip so it always has power, but it is also usable with batteries. Of course, what good is a hidden compartment if it isn't hidden? I attached some picture frame hardware to the back of a picture that will conceal the door. And then I super glued the key fob to the back of the picture as well. The door has the other half of the picture frame hardware attached to it, and it's important to do four attachment points so that when you pull on the picture it won't tilt or come off the door. I was very intentional about the placement of the hardware, so that when the picture slides all the way to the right, it's centered. But when you slide the picture to the left and tilt it up, the key fob unlocks the latch and you can then swing the compartment open. I set it up so the tilting was necessary because otherwise when the door is open the fob would be constantly unlocking the latch. This project is almost done but there's still one more thing to do. I decided I wanted to make a mantle that would go above the fireplace, so I cut some hickory down and mitered the corners, fitting them together with painter's tape and glue. I cut some 2x4s down to help the mantle hold its shape while the glue was drying, but they would also be used later to attach the mantle to the wall. After the glue had dried, I sanded everything down to be nice and smooth, but there were still some gaps in the miters, and the screwdriver trick didn't work to close them. So I ended up filling them with a stainable wood filler by Varathane, and then once again sanded everything smooth. I'm using a dark walnut oil-based stain by Minwax, and I'm really impressed with how well the hickory took to it. hang it, I attached the first cut down 2x4 strip to the wall and then used a 4 foot level to make sure that it was completely level. I then attached the second strip to the first strip with more screws and then slid the mantle over top both 
with a nice friction fit. I'm really happy with how the mantle turned out, but I'm most pleased with how this whole project came together as a whole. It looks so much better than the blank wall that it was before. Before I move on to whatever project is coming up next, it's time to sit down and relax.